How many of you have ever planted a seed? You look at how small it seems in your hand. You bury it in the dirt, you heap the soil on it, you add the water, and then you walk away and you leave it. And you have to wait until the soil and the sun and the rain and the seed do their mysterious work. Have you ever marveled at the size of a plant when you know its humble beginnings, like how an acorn becomes a mighty oak, or a cone, those tiny little cones become the towering pines? Have you ever gone on a crusade against weeds in your garden and then felt it the next day in your sore muscles and your stiff back? Or maybe you're a baker, maybe you've added a little packet of that strange smelling product to your basic flour and oil ingredients and then knead the dough you created. Maybe some of you jumped on the sourdough craze during COVID. You learned how to use a part of that uh, mixture in the jar in your freezer to bake a new loaf of bread and then feed that mixture so you have it for the next time. So if you can picture break, baking bread for your loved ones, planting and tending a garden, even marveling at plants that defy all odds, maybe those ones that grow like in the cracks in the sidewalk, you can see why Jesus reached for parables. These stories with intent, as they have been called, they strike us somewhere special. They go past those logical centers in our brains, and those logical centers like to throw up objections and insist on checking facts. These stories enter our imaginations. And when Jesus wanted to teach people what the kingdom of God was like, he often chose stories. He chose images, even, the stuff of everyday life, stories about farmers and bakers and fishers and people who own land and people who farm. And I wonder if you had been in that crowd when Jesus taught about that mustard seed that grows into a huge shrub that becomes home for the birds and provides shade for them. Maybe when you walked home that evening, every time you saw one of those mustard plants by the side of the road, because they were fairly ubiquitous, they were found everywhere and they had medicinal uses and were freely available to everyone. Maybe you would think about how that's part of the good world that God created and it would bring Jesus' teachings to mind afresh. Or the next time you went into your kitchen and pulled out your flour and oil to bake for your household, you'd be reminded about how Jesus said that little piece of leaven would work its way through the dough. It's estimated the number of measures that the, that parable talks about is roughly 60 pounds of flour. So if you baked bread with that much flour, you can imagine it isn't just going to feed your family. You would have enough to share with others. And in this way, Jesus leaves us uh, with his teaching, with something that lasts just a little bit longer than a set of prepositions. Or if he'd given us all these teachings in a bullet point form and said, take this home and study it. Klein Snodgrass, who wrote a comprehensive book on Jesus' parables, says this, The importance of the parables of Jesus can hardly be overestimated. At no point are the vitality, the relevance, the usefulness of the teachings of Jesus so attractive or compelling as a good story. Children and adults don't say, tell me some facts. They want a story. Stories are inherently interesting. Discourse we tolerate, a story we attend. Stories entertain, inform, involve, motivate, authenticate, and mirror our existence. Apart from personal stories, said Snodgrass, uh, or apart from personal experiences, excuse me, stories are the quickest way for learning. So Jesus' stories are a gift from God. And with that, let's turn to one of them, at least in this Matthew chapter 13. Now, all three of the stories that Jesus told in the chapter that we read, they address an important problem. And I think many of you would agree that it is a problem. You see, when Jesus began to preach, he told everyone, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Jesus said God's kingdom is nearby. It's at hand. It's so close we could reach out and touch it. We believe that Jesus not only spoke about and announced God's kingdom, but that Jesus in some way brought God's kingdom to earth when he lived his life as he ministered, even through his death and his resurrection. And yet, 
We look around and we see all the things around us that are still wrong. And we think this surely does not reflect what life is like when God is the king. Evils of all kind still exist, and sometimes they seem to be growing and even flourishing. We know about all the ways that life does not match our expectations, the way that things are frequently unfair or difficult or frustrating or hurtful. We know that we struggle and suffer as part of being alive and being a human being on planet Earth. And many things come to mind, even aside from terrible natural disasters such as those earthquakes in Syria and Turkey, the images that are broadcast from those just break our hearts and we don't know what to do in response to such suffering. But even in addition to things like that, we all know that sometimes the system is rigged, that racism and sexism and classism and every kind of ism you can imagine are still alive and well and flourishing among us, even though there have been people who are educating and writing books and marching and working hard to change those things. The slavery we thought that we had eradicated has turned into human trafficking that still infects our entire world. And not to mention the fact that there's so much infighting. People that we identify with, other Christians, seem to fight with one another more than they fight with anyone else. And of course, you all know the tensions in your own hearts. The difficulties and the wrongs and the worlds out there exist alongside the wrongs that are visited to us on smaller scales like when our health falters or fails or gives us a scare, or a family member is suffering and we're powerless to help them. We feel the unfairness of the hiring practices of a company we had hoped to work for, or we experience job loss, or we rail against the unequal distribution of resources and the wealth gap between the rich and the poor, or we find that our dreams dry up without them ever having to come to pass. Sometimes the relationships we counted on fail us, or we have to accept that economic hardship isn't all that far from most of our households. There is so much in the world that is difficult, and sometimes it's even downright evil. And you know, it exists side by side with the good and the wonderful and the awe-inspiring and the heartwarming. As Kate Bowler loves to say, life is so beautiful, life is so hard. And then when we look at those hard parts, we begin to wonder if the kingdom of God that Jesus announced and described as right next to us, so near we could reach out and take hold of it, we go, is it as near as Jesus taught it was? We begin to wonder if the money we give to fight poverty really matters when corrupt governments steal aid, or we're disillusioned when another faith leader is ensnared in abuse allegations or embroiled in monetary scandals, and this isn't just people who call themselves Christian. These are Christian leaders. We grieve when people who taught us about the faith seem to fall victim to the next conspiracy theory, or they manage to conflate loving their country with loving Jesus. The weeds of the world are so overwhelming, aren't they? Sometimes it's hard to wonder how we could say, this is my father's world. If every person on this planet is, as we affirm, created in the image of God, and God only uses good seed to sow, as we like to say, God never makes junk. If Jesus came to announce that the good news that the kingdom of heaven is so close that we can live it right now, then why does the world have so many problems? Why are our churches such a mixture of the good and the beautiful and the judgmental and the hypocritical? Why are we ourselves such a mixture of things that are uplifting and inspiring and also destructive? Well, Klein Snodgrass writes that all three of the parables that we read this morning deal with that very question. The mystery of the kingdom, as he puts it. The fact that the kingdom is present, but in an unexpected way. The implicit question behind all three parables, he says, is can the work of Jesus and his small group really be the kingdom when so much else is wrong? And if we focus especially on that first parable, the one of the wheat and the weeds, the question behind that parable specifically is how can this be the kingdom if evil is still present? Jesus tells the story. The kingdom of heaven is like a person who sows a field 
The crop that person sows is good seed. So far, so good. But at night, an enemy comes and sows another crop, a crop of weeds in this field of good wheat. And what's more, those weeds are nearly indistinguishable from the good crop that has sown there. And that's when the servants of the field's owner notice that something is wrong, when it begins to sprout and grow. There's this thriving crop, but right alongside it and mixed in with it is another plant that they don't want. And in fact, most commentaries said the plant that they referred to is toxic. And right there, actually, we have a pretty good lesson that is sometimes overlooked in commentaries on this parable, but I think we need to be reminded of it anyway. Again, from Klein Snodgrass, he says, the parable helps us to address our consternation that evil is still at work and that life is not fair, even though Christ and his kingdom have come. God is not the only one at work, and not all actions in the world can be attributed to God. God often gets blamed for every event that occurs, but God is not the cause of every event. So evil is real. And not all things in this world can be attributed to God or to God's will. That's one thing we learn about this picture of this field that had good seed, but this enemy comes and adds hostile contributions. And now what we have before us is a mess brimming and alive with both good weeds or good plants and toxic weeds. And so we stand in the place of the owner of the field and we look at this mess of wheat and weeds before us. And the servants that we have hired to look after the field demand an answer. What do we do about this? Rather unexpectedly, the owner of the field says, let it be. Let them grow together. If we aggressively eradicate the weeds, we risk the health of the plants that we actually want to grow. And in this story, we learn something about the nature of the kingdom of God. Now, when you're confronted with parables, one key to help you understanding them is to think about who in the story or what in the story you might identify with. I think that's a helpful question when we look at this parable in particular. Many of us, I would wager, probably put ourselves, I'm not going to say the shoes, I'm going to say in the roots of the good plants. We're the wheat, right? And for good measure, we could probably identify the bad and the harmful weeds out there, can't we? Maybe I should just speak for myself here. But I freely admit that as I mulled over this passage this week, that is the move I almost always made. Obviously, we think we are the good people. We know what's what. Our opinion about the world is the right one. And we have found the way to the good life. We are the children of God's kingdom. Well, I do think that's true. But the danger of holding that point of view, of course, is that then it becomes really obvious if I am the good wheat, then anyone who's different than I am, people who hold different political opinions, perhaps, people who practice their faith differently, people who live differently, well, they are what's wrong in the world. They're obviously the weeds if I am the wheat. But I wonder if there's maybe a more valuable identification with this parable that we can make. Now, later on in the parable, Jesus' disciples come to him and they ask him what this means. And he offers them an explanation. And this actually isn't all that common. Of all the parables that Jesus told, he only explained three of them. But this is one of the three that he explains. And when Jesus explains the parable, he actually identifies all the elements the sower, the field, the good and the bad seed, the enemy, what the harvest is, and the identity of the harvesters. But the one element that Jesus doesn't name is the slaves, the ones who notice the presence of the wheat and the weeds alongside one another and ask the owner of the field what they should do. I wonder if we could gain more by seeing the story through their eyes instead. If we do this, then maybe it makes us easier to understand what we do when we encounter things that we consider evil in the world. Lutheran preacher Caroline Lewis writes this, This parable is a description of reality that we'd rather not admit. Can't God do something about the enemy? And now, what good is God anyway if God can't see to it that evil is eliminated, she asks. She asks. 
Well, the parable of the wheat and the weed, she says, is not told for the sake of action, but for the sake of honesty. She says, our presence in the world as Christians is not about a full-blown plan to rid evil at every turn. Is our calling, she says, as disciples to seek out and purge sin and evil? Frankly, I don't want that job. I don't trust myself, but I do trust God. Our presence in the world as Christians is to be the good, to be the gospel, to be the salt, to be the light, because that's what we are, says Jesus to his disciples, and this should be good news. This parable calls us simply to be. So we are to be the good. We are to live out our identity as children in the kingdom of God, to be the salt and the light, but to judge where the good ends and the evil begins, or to condemn other people out there as what's wrong in the world, that is not our place. Now that's not the same thing as saying there is no difference between good and evil. And it's not say, the same thing as saying there's no judgment. Instead, what it does is it leaves the matter in God's hands. It trusts that God is going to sort things out in the end. And in the end, God is going to put everything right. God will sort out the things that are difficult and ambiguous. And we trust in God's judgment because we trust the character of the judge. And I think we also need to remind ourselves early and often that we are not the judge. So these parables, they're rich. That's why Jesus reached for them. There's a lot to say about all of them. I've hardly touched on the other two. But perhaps it's enough just to get those pictures in our minds so that we can reflect on them and return to them. I did want to leave you one thing to think about, to chew on as you go this week. And this particular thing is a minority opinion. It only came up in a couple of the commentaries, but it was an interesting thought. So I said it before you, you can decide whether or not you think it is worthy. You see, when the wheat and the weeds are gathered and bundled together and the weeds are burned at the end of the parable, we see this as a negative thing. It's usually a punishment, we think. But some authors wonder if maybe it wasn't quite as negative an image as we think. And this is how their argument goes. The weeds are put into the fire. Now, at that time, fuel was hard to come by. It wasn't as abundant as going and chopping down a tree in the forest and fueling the fire. You needed to really look for it. The weeds become a valuable source of fuel. And they're cheap as well. Fuel for the fire would cook food. It could heat your house. It would benefit people. And that's incidentally one of the points of both the parables of, that surround it, the parable of the mustard seed and the parable of the leaven. You see, the seed and the leaven are of little account and undervalued. They're common, they're ordinary, even hidden. And yet they end up providing shade and nesting space or food for many. So some people think that maybe those weeds are the same thing. Once upon a time I heard a weed described as a plant with poor PR. So maybe weeds are those things that we discount in the world. They're judged as useless, maybe even evil. But in the end, they can still serve many when they get into the hands of God. Even those things that are not directly from God's hand, even those things that maybe were sown by an enemy, they can still be put to good use. A profound thing I heard once is when per one person uh, who was suffering from cancer spoke to a Another person, she said, you know, God didn't cause this suffering, but God will make it matter. So God doesn't cause evil or difficulty in the world either, but God will make it matter. So that's what I wish more than anything this week as you go away and think about the stories that you've heard. Perhaps you will consider how the kingdom of God seems so insignificant, even hidden, but it grows in ways that you cannot begin to imagine. Maybe you'll think about the good and the bad that's mixed into our lives, into the world, and remember, you can trust the character of the one who sorts it all out in the end. Or maybe you'll go home and have a sandwich for lunch. When you have that piece of bread, or you think about the bulbs you want to plant in your garden, you'll remember the stories that Jesus told, and you'll wonder, now how is the kingdom of heaven like this?
Would you bow with me in a word of prayer? Lord of stories, Jesus taught us through stories and through the wisdom of a shared word. Teach us that we may learn, grow, and love, because we pray these things for the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. Go out into the world shining like the sun to bring the kingdom of heaven to life and let God worry about the rest. And as you go, may the grace of Jesus attend you, may the love of God surround you, and may the Holy Spirit keep you. Amen. Go in peace.